Thank you guys so much for joining us again. Find your seat because we are very, very excited to introduce our next speaker and in particular the presentation that he's going to give. So if you don't mind grabbing your seat, we will go ahead and introduce Keith Burns. So welcome to the stage, Keith. Keith combines 25 years of no-till farming with 10 years of teaching agriculture and computers. In addition to no-tilling, 2,500 acres of irrigated dryland corn, soybeans, rye, triticale, peas, sunflowers, and buckwheat in south central Nebraska. He is also co-owner and operates Green Cover Seed, which is one of the major cover crop seed providers and crop uh, educators in the United States. So without further ado, I welcome to the stage Keith Burns. Imagine if you go home from this conference and you get home and there's somebody there on your doorstep and they're from the government and they say, we're taking half your land. You've got too much. We're just taking half of it. And then a week later they come back and say, of the land that we left you, we're only going to let you plant it every other year. And you can only put your bull in with your cows every other year. And we've got a special chip for your tractor that will reduce the horsepower by 50%. So you can only be 50% productive on what you have left. What would you do? Well, you'd be mad as hell and you'd do something about it. I don't know what you'd do, but you'd do something. Now, I'm not here saying the government's gonna do that. I've got good news and the bad news. The government is not going to do that. The bad news is, folks, this has already happened. You've already lost 50% of your most valuable asset you have as a farmer. Your topsoil. Hugh Hammond Bennett, standing in a field that's been washed away. The Dust Bowl, taking even more. Now this picture is from the 30s, but we can all find pictures on the internet, maybe on your own phones, of this exact same thing still happening today. We've lost more than 50% of the most valuable asset we have in agriculture, and that's our topsoil. <clears throat> I don't know if any of you have ever seen this. This is a rest stop in Iowa. <clears throat> 1850, the average topsoil depth in Iowa was 14 inches. The year 2000, 5.5. Way more than 50%. And that's Iowa. What is Kansas like? What is Nebraska like? And of that 50% that we still have, it's not nearly as productive as it used to be. This is the same soil right over the fence line. The one on the right, it still has carbon. That's why it's black and rich and looks productive. The one on the left, same type of soil, but it, the carbon has been farmed out of it. We have lost more than 50% of the carbon that's in the topsoil that is still left and it makes us way less productive. Well, at Green Cover, our mission statement is to help people regenerate God's creation for future generations. Because as mad as hell as you would be if the government came and took half your land, there's not near enough of us that are mad enough about the fact of how much we've lost, how much has been eroded away, how much carbon we've lost from our topsoil. But I applaud you because you're here and you are doing something about it. So at Green Cover, we try to help people do that as well. One of the great things that we get to do at Green Cover is we get invited to be part of lots of cool projects like the Prairie Food Expo here. Uh, but a few years ago, we were uh, asked to be part of this Living Soil film series. And, and uh, the, the Soil Health Institute was putting this together. And if you've never seen this, it's a great, great uh, movie. It's, it's a full-length feature film, about 60 minutes. Uh, it's free for anybody to watch. Just go to thelivingsoilfilm.com. But they're putting together a documentary of why soil is so important and, and how we can fix it, how we can regenerate it, how we can do something about all that's been lost. And so I just wanted to share this little clip with you. Uh, they, they sent this film crew out, this big film crew out on this beautiful day in October because they wanted to get us a picture of us putting cover crops in the soil as we were harvesting corn because the principle of soil health, 
we want something growing at all times. So had the hired man go hook up the big tractor to the big old air seeder, and I thought, man, this is gonna be great. We're gonna be movie stars. We're gonna be in the film pictures. And just about the time that you think, man, things are about as good as it can get. <laughs> that's what happens. <laughs> yeah, for those of you that have seen it, it's still funny, isn't it? <laughs> it's still funny to see someone else screw up on a colossal scale and have it captured in high definition drone footage. <laughs> yeah, laughing with me. Well, we are all about helping people regenerate God's creation for future generations, and primarily the soil. And if we're going to get back what has been lost, and we can. Rob talked about it. Michael Thompson is going to be talking about it tomorrow. There's going to be so many people talking about how we can do this but it's going to be a lot easier to do if we understand the system that we're trying to rebuild. And so what I want to try to do here this afternoon is try to explain to you one of the most complex systems in all of God's creation, and that is what is going on in the soil, because it is a very complex system. And I'm going to do that by comparing it to another equally complex system, but it's one that we understand infinitely better because we live in it every single day of our lives, and that's the economy of a country. If you remember back to your economics class in high school or in college, there's some basic principles to, to economics, supply, demand, currency, capital, energy, infrastructure, defense and protection. All those things are incredibly critical if you're gonna have a healthy economy of a country. And I'm here to tell you that those same things are going on in our soils. And by understanding them and understanding how they work and how we can manipulate and work with them is the key to creating healthy soil. And it's the key to doing something about regaining and regenerating what we've lost. So the first thing that we need to keep in mind is that our soil economy, it's based on solar energy. Really, as farmers, all we're doing is we're capturing solar energy and we're converting it into something that has value. Our whole economy is based on the sun. And then the main players, of course, the soil and the plants. As farmers, we understand that really well. But the thing that we oftentimes forget, and, and again, because you're here, you probably don't fall into that as much as the general farmer, but we often overlook the animals. And particularly uh, in the case of my talk here today, it's not going to be about cattle. Uh, Michael Thompson and others will talk a lot more about livestock integration. But I'll be talking a lot about the biology, these little animals, these little critters, these microbes in the soil, and the key role that they play in making this economy work the way it was supposed to. So, Economic principle number one is supply. You can't have an economy if you don't have supply. You have to create something. Plants in this economy produce carbon. This is photosynthesis, the most important, the most basic chemical formula in the world, but it's CO2 plus H2O, pretty simple stuff, the energy of the sun, the chlorophyll uh, cells in a plant, and it creates C6H12O6, a simple glucose, sugar, and oxygen. That's it. That's what plants do. You might say, well, I'm raising corn. Well, uh, you're really converting sunlight into glucose, CO2 into glucose. That's really what you're doing. So that's what plants are providing to the economy. The soil is providing nutrients. All of these minerals here, uh, just forget nitrogen off this list here because that's not coming from the soil. We'll talk about it later. But all these other things, potassium and phosphorus and calcium and magnesium and iron, these are in your soils. It's what your soils are made up of. It's the mineral portion of the soil, and that is what is the soil is bringing to the economy. It's also providing a habitat for roots and biology. These things have to have a place to live. It's their house. It's where they live, and so soil provides that. And then again, as Rob was talking about, it provides water storage. And the more carbon we can have, the more water we can store. Hugely important. Hugely important in dry land areas. And it's hugely important in irrigated areas as well. We have to be able to store the water that we get. Otherwise, we're going to be in a world of hurt. I was at a conference in California once, and I overheard two guys talking. And I thought this was the perfect answer to the question, 
how much rain did you get? Okay, because that's a pretty common question anytime it rains. And the one guy asked the other one, how much rain did you get? And the other old guy said, all of it. And that's the only answer we should give. How much rain did you get? I got all of it. Because it doesn't matter if it rains two inches. If you only got an inch in the ground and stored, that's all you should ever claim. The rest was just wasted. And it may have been worse than wasted. It may have taken some of your topsoil and your nutrients along with it. Water storage, incredibly important. The biology, they're providing all kinds of services. They're doing nutrient fixation. They're cycling. They're making things available. They're providing defense and protection. And we're going to look at these different services that the biology provides as we go through this talk. On the demand side, because supply does you no good without demand, what is being demanded in the economy, pretty basic stuff here for plants. They need nutrients and water. They need services. They have to be protected and supported. I mean, think about it. Think about how cool a plant is. You look at a plant, and you go, wow, that's a plant. But think of everything it does, and it can't move. It can't move. It has to be very, very good at taking advantage of the resources that it has right around it, because it can't move. And so it has to recruit these services uh, to protect itself and to provide for its needs. Soil needs carbon. Soil is not going to work properly without carbon. And you're going to hear people talk about carbon until you're maybe sick of carbon, but it's that important to drive the entire system. And we'll talk a lot about this because the name of this talk is Carbonomics. Uh, but soil also needs services. It has to be protected. You know, if, if you can go out to your field and you can see your soil, that's not a good thing. Our goal on our farm is to never see our soil unless we go looking for it. We need to be able to scrape away the residue and find it. Now, we don't always achieve that goal because some years it's really dry and we can't grow enough residue to keep it covered. Or our biology is now so active that it's consuming all of that and we have bare soil. But it's still our goal to keep the soil covered. And the biology, well, they're living organisms. They need the same basic things that you and I need. They need a place to live, and they need food to eat. And when you can provide those things, they will do amazing things within the system, and they do it really, really cheap. But you have to provide those things for them. So in a human economy, a strong human economy, one of the leading indicators is low unemployment rate. You hear them talk about that all the time. That's because everybody in the system is involved in working, they're contributing, they're supplying something, but they're also engaged on the demand side. There's buying and selling going on, and everybody is involved in contributing, and that's what we need in our agricultural system. The soil economy is going to be strongest when the plants, the soil, and the animals, the biology, are all producing and consuming, and diversity is very important. Just as in, in the economy of a country, our economy would be terribly weak if we only had one thing that we produced, one thing that we exported, one thing that we grew or manufactured. We would be very, very weak and subject to the, the winds of change. Same way in our soil. If we're only growing one crop, if we only have one type of biology, if we're only using one type of input, our economy is going to be very weak and can be toppled very easily. But here's what happens. Since we're talking about economics, I think we can talk about the, the concept of welfare. Because when we externally provide the plant with everything that it needs from the outside, particularly fertility inputs, crop protection inputs, we weaken the economy. We essentially are putting part of the workforce to the unemployment line. And it's the biology. And, and oftentimes we have to do this because the biology is not there. And then our plants look sick because we don't have the services that they're supposed to be providing. And so then we step in, and, and I'm not saying we shouldn't. We have to step in, and we have to provide that service. Essentially, it's the welfare payment. It's the handout to the system in order for our crop to produce. But when we do that, we weaken the system, and we make it more expensive. Now, I really like Abraham Lincoln's concept when it comes to welfare. He says, you cannot help men permanently by doing for them what they could and should do for themselves. 
And I like this because he's not saying you should never help people. You should. But you're not going to help them over the long run or for the long term if you continue to do for them what they're capable of doing for themselves. It's the same way in our soil. We will never build our soils, we will never build our biological systems if we continually provide to the system what the system is capable of providing for itself. And so we have to get out of this welfare mentality when it comes to our agriculture, this high input mentality, because it's really expensive to do. And we have found that out over the last couple of years. It has got more expensive all the time. And I'm not here saying we should eliminate all inputs, okay? We farm. We haven't eliminated all inputs, but we've sure reduced them. We have cut down where we can, and we're trying to find areas where we can cut down even more. Would I like to get rid of all the fertilizers and chemicals? Sure. We all would. And some guys are. There's some really innovative no-till organic farmers who have eliminated pretty well everything, except cover crops. They still use cover crops, by the way. <laughs> but our goal is to reduce them as much as possible, to get the system working the way that God created it to work, soil, plants, and especially the biology. So we don't have all the answers on our farm, but I think we're at least asking the right question because now, before we make a decision, we ask the question, how will this affect the biology? We never used to ask that. We never used to care. Didn't even know it was there. But now we do. And so now we have to think about that. How will it affect the biology? Okay, so supply and demand. The third economic principle is currency. And I even hesitate to talk about this because we've got some real currency experts here in the room. But currency is important because it allows consumers and producers to exchange your goods and services much more efficiently. If you don't have currency, your system is very slow to respond if you have to trade in cows or beads instead of currency. And in our system, we have the perfect currency to drive it very efficiently, and that's carbon. Carbon is the currency that drives the soil economy. That's why this talk is called Carbonomics. That's why when you listen to people talk about regenerative ag, you're going to hear carbon, 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 carbon. It's that important. It's the currency that drives the system. Now, photosynthesis, CO2 plus H2O, C6, H12, O6. This glucose molecule, this C6 right here, this does not stay as glucose in the plant for very long. It takes that as a building block, it strips that carbon off, and it turns it into thousands of other carbon compounds. It's the building block, it's the currency that drives the whole system. And it's what it's going to use to make payments. So as a parent, you probably told your kids this, money doesn't grow on trees, okay? Most of us have told our kids that, but you know what? As a farmer, in this system, money does grow on trees and on corn plants and wheat plants and soybean plants. We are literally printing our currency to drive this system forward. And the more we can do, the better, the richer, the wealthier, the more robust this economy becomes. Here's how it works. Plants producing carbon through liquid, or plants produce carbon through photosynthesis and they're going to be making payments through root exudates. And I got a really, really cool picture that I'm going to show you later uh, of this actually happening. So these, these carbon payments are leaked out through the root system. The biological life takes that in. It is accepting that payment. And in exchange, it is delivering nutrients. It's delivering protection. It's delivering all these valuable services to the plant. Now, now plants... I told you they're pretty amazing. They can't move, but they're actually quite smart. Probably maybe smarter than some people I know. Because if they're making payments and they're not getting anything in return, guess what? They stop making those payments. If you have no biology in your soil, in order to take in the carbon that the plant is giving out, that plant will sense that and it stops putting the carbon in the soil. And now your soil that was low in carbon gets even lower. The poor get poorer. 
the rich get richer. Because when you have a lot of biology in your soil, guess what? That plant is not photosynthesizing at 100% when it's growing. It has the capacity to photosynthesize a lot more than it currently is because as much as 50% of the carbon that it makes through photosynthesis is not used to grow the plant or the roots or the seeds. As much as 50% of that is released into the soil to feed the biology. And those plants can crank it up when it needs to, to do that. And they will do that when they sense more biology in the soil. Look, carbon is essential to all life forms. We're 19% carbon by mass. It can form over 10 million different compounds. It's the most important, but most overlooked of all plant nutrients. How many of you have ever sat down with your agronomist and said, let's make a carbon plan for this year? Hey, you talk about nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium. We don't talk about carbon but it needs it in larger quantities than anything else. And it's the main food source for soil biology. It's what these things eat. When you have carbon in your soil, it can normalize your soil pH. So if you're too high or too low, it matters less when you have higher carbon soils. It increases your cation exchange capacity. It increases the availability of all those nutrients, and it can help reduce the availability of things that can build up to toxic levels, like sodium and aluminum. Think about it as a currency now. It can be collected through photosynthesis. It can be traded to soil organisms. That's the spending portion. You can save it through soil organic matter, which we'll talk about next, and it's desired by all members of the economy. And a currency is no good unless everybody in your economy wants it and accepts it. That's the only way it works. And it works in the soil because carbon is desired by everybody. It has different states, just like our, our currency does. We have the gaseous form in CO2. We have liquid carbon. It's moving up and down through the plants and through the soil. And then we have solid carbon form, as, which is what's in living organisms in organic matter. And it can switch from one phase to the another very, very quickly. Scientists will tell us that it's a very short period of time, a matter of, of, of hours for it to go from CO2 in the atmosphere to liquid carbon in the plant, out through the roots of the plant, and into the body of a microbe. It is the currency that drives the system. And when you have excess currency, now you can turn that into capital. Because currency is great. It helps us get by with our day-to-day -day things. But it doesn't help for our long-term growth. For that, we need capital. Capital is simply accumulated, stored, or saved currency, and we need it for growth and stability. And in this system, our soil organic matter is our soil capital. Now, we could spend the rest of the week talking about the importance of soil organic matter. I think with this group, we understand how many functions of the soil are directly tied to the organic matter primarily the carbon portion of that, but it's very, very important. We need it for growth and stability. And what we see is that a capital-rich economy like the United States, one of the reasons the United States has been such a successful economy is because we've had access to lots of capital. We've been able to grow our business because we've had access to a lot of capital. We've been able to borrow money, and, and that's allowed us to grow. And it's the same way in our soils. Our soils on our ground that have the highest organic matter levels are always the most productive, the most stable, the most resilient, and the most efficient. Easily. We know that. We just always know where we've got 5 and 6% organic matter soils. It's always going to be better than the stuff that's 2. That's not even a question. It's that important in the soil. <clears throat> now, but just like you can't increase your savings account unless you're earning more than you spend, okay, unless you're the government, they got different rules, but unless you're earning more than you're spending, you can't increase your savings account. You will never build your capital. And it's the same way with your soil. Unless you're putting more capital or more carbon into your soil than what you're exporting out of the soil, your organic matter levels will never go up. <clears throat> and we've got plenty of customers, plenty of neighbors, who they're growing corn and beans and they're doing a really good job of it and they're growing really high yields, but their organic matters are flatlined. They're not going up. It's like the, the guy Rob was talking about. The organic matter levels never move because they were exporting carbon every time they did a cultivation. 
And this is where cover crops play such an important role in, in this system is because cover crops put carbon into the soil through the root exudates. And again, I got some pictures later that we'll look at, but also through the above ground biomass and we're not exporting it. We're not hauling off a truckload of corn, which has a lot of carbon. A truckload of soybeans, which has a lot of carbon. Hay bales, which have a lot of carbon. We're not exporting anything with a cover crop. All of that carbon capture through photosynthesis is going right back to the soil. And that's why cover crops have such a key, important role to play in the system is because they're putting into your savings account without taking out. And that's how we can build organic matter levels. That's how we can increase that. All right, energy and resources. Energy is a pretty big deal these days. I talked earlier about how our energy comes from the sun. Free energy. Government hasn't figured out how to tax that one yet. They're probably talking about it. Our energy for our system is free. We just have to capture it. All we got to do is put up these solar collectors. And as farmers, it's way easier than these man-made solar collectors, which can be effective. All we have to do is plant seeds. Plant seeds and out pop these little green solar panels that can take the photons from the sun and turn it into chemical energy, which we can then transform into all kinds of energy. Our energy for this is free. And a healthy soil economy should not need significant purchased energy inputs. And I say that knowing full well that we spend a lot of money yet on energy on our farm. And I would guess most of you do too. But these rich prairie soils that we're farming were created over thousands of years with no outside energy input other than the sun. Now, when we start exporting and we start extracting out of the system, we certainly have to put back in but not nearly as much as what we have been doing. And if you were to look at the energy budget of a farm, the biggest line item, if you were doing this honestly and truthfully, the biggest energy input on your farm, it's not diesel fuel, it's not propane, it's not natural gas, it's not electricity, it's nitrogen fertilizer. And let me show you why that is such a huge energy input into our system. Because as we move from energy into resources, the number one thing plants need is carbon. Okay, we've already talked about carbon, how important that is. We don't spend any money on carbon. Okay, it is pulling it out of the atmosphere. And I don't know how well you can see this tiny little pink sliver up here. That's the amount of carbon. About four one hundredths, this is an old slide, it says 0.038, a little over four one hundredths of one percent. Not four percent, not four tenths of a percent, four one hundredths of one percent of our atmosphere is CO2. That's that little tiny pink sliver, but we can pull all the carbon, the plant can pull the carbon that it needs to grow 250, 300 bushel corn out of that. Pretty incredible thing. This big blue thing here, 78 percent of our atmosphere is nitrogen. We don't spend any money on carbon we spend billions of dollars on nitrogen. And you're not paying for the nitrogen. Above every acre of crop ground that you own, that I own, that you'll drive past between here and there, above every acre, there's 30,000 tons of nitrogen. 30,000 tons of nitrogen above every acre of our crop ground. I don't think we're paying for nitrogen. Well, what are we paying for? Well, here's the problem. There's good news and there's bad news. With all this nitrogen in the atmosphere, the good news is we're not dead. Because if you've ever had a whiff of anhydrous ammonia, you know what that does to you. It, it, people have died. We've had neighbors that have died or been severely injured from anhydrous inhalation. I'm sure you have too. It is incredibly caustic to the human body but in the atmosphere, it's held as dinitrogen. It's two nitrogen molecules, and they're bonded together with three sets of very strong covalent bonds, and it's completely inert. I'm breathing in nitrogen right now. It's doing nothing to me. Because they're tied to each other, they don't want to react to anything in my body. 
and I just expel them right back out. The same way, that's the good news, we're not dead. The bad news is plants can't do anything with that nitrogen either. As plants are sucking in atmosphere to, to strip off the carbon out of the CO2 fraction, which is very little, it's pulling in all this nitrogen. It doesn't have a filter that is only bringing in CO2. It's taking all that nitrogen into the plant leaf and through the stomata as well. But just like my lungs can do nothing with it, plants can't do anything either. It's completely inert to the plant. And so we have nitrogen deficient plants drowning in a sea of nitrogen because it's tied up in that dinitrogen form. So what we have to do is we have to fix it. We have to make it available. We have to break this apart. Tremendous energy taken to break that apart. That's where the energy part comes in. And then we combine it with hydrogen and oxygen and we can make these different forms of nitrogen that plants can then use. And we can do this. We can make factories that can do this on a large scale. Uh, the Haber-Bosch process uh, you know, developed in the world wars to cr essentially make bombs, okay? Because nitrogen, once it's broken apart, is very powerful, very reactive, and it, you can build bombs out of it, and once the wars were over, they started making nitrogen fertilizer. And you can do that, and we have had, as a, as a rule, general rule here in American agriculture, we've had relatively inexpensive sources of synthetic nitrogen. But that's come to an end. There's no longer anything known as cheap nitrogen, is there? Because the energy cost to do this is very expensive. But what it takes man billions of dollars in these fancy schmancy factories to do, God created these tiny little microbes that do the exact same thing. They're taking, and this is rhizobia, rhizobia bacteria can take that dinitrogen molecule, two nitrogens put together, they can apply the right chemicals, they can pull those nitrogen molecules apart, they can add hydrogen and oxygen, they turn it into plant available forms, and then they feed it to its host plant. Because as cool as rhizobia are, and it can pull dinitrogen apart, it can't eat it. Its food source is not nitrogen, its food source is carbon. So these guys will only do this if the plant is willing to pay up in the currency of the economy, which is carbon. So those liquid root exudates have to go to this biology in order for them to have the energy to make the nitrogen to get back to the plant. It's a beautiful system. And, and we all take advantage of this when we grow legume crops. And, and by the way, a pet peeve of mine is don't ever say, well, I grow soybeans, they make their own nitrogen. No, they don't. A soybean plant can't do anything with the nitrogen in the atmosphere. It's the rhizobia that that soybean plant is allowing to grow on its root system that's doing the real work. All the soybean plant is doing, it's paying for it through the root exudates. So we all know about that. Alfalfa, soybeans, peas, any of those legumes. But we're not limited to that, folks. We think that we often are, but we're not. There are other things in the soil, free living nitrogen fixers, that don't have to associate with the legume plant. These are, are, are single-celled organisms. These guys back here, uh, there's many billions of rhizobia in one of these uh, nodules. These are single-celled organisms like Azospirillum and Zotobacter, and they're discovering new ones all the time. These things can do the same thing. They'll take dinitrogen out of the atmosphere, they'll pull that apart, add hydrogen, add oxygen, make it available to the plant, and they can sell this off to the highest bidder. They don't care if you're a soybean plant, a corn plant, a wheat plant, brome grass, or a weed. If you're going to feed me carbon, I'll give you some nitrogen. <coughs> Pretty cool. So the question then becomes, <coughs> well, why not just dump a whole bunch of these critters out there ahead of my corn crop, and we'll just grow the heck out of corn with no nitrogen at all? Well, that's a good question. <coughs> Here's the problem. These things, soybean rhizobia, if you're growing 70 bushel soybeans, <clears throat> that takes about 400 pounds of nitrogen to produce. How many people would grow soybeans if you had to dump 400 pounds of nitrogen out there to grow them? Not very many. 
But these things can make 400 pounds of nitrogen in 60 days. That's a lot. That's incredible. It's because they can form these nodules, and, and there's all sorts of scientific ways that they do that. But they're very, very efficient because they have the ability to colonize. These guys, independent contractors, they're W-9 employees. So these guys are not going to create 400 pounds of nitrogen. They're going to do 40 or 50 pounds of nitrogen a year. Now, can I grow a big corn crop on that? Well, it'll help, but probably not all the way. But what does 40 or 50 pounds of nitrogen do in a closed regenerative system when I'm growing forages and I'm grazing cattle on it? That's a pretty big deal. What does 40 or 50 pounds of nitrogen do when you put it on a cover crop? It makes a huge difference. So there's places where these really fit into the system, but they're not going to completely you're not going to be able to get that huge nitrogen uh, contribution that you get with legumes. So you still need legumes in your rotation. You still need all these things. But both of these things will only do this if the plant is willing to feed them carbon. And that plant is smart enough. It's not going to do any of these things if you're giving it welfare payments and nitrogen into the soil. Your soybeans are not going to be incentivized to nodulate and give their carbon away to the rhizobia if there's all kinds of free nitrogen in the soil. They'll suck that up first. <clears throat> Same way with these other guys, the azospirillum uh, and the zodobacter, they're not going to be nearly as active or productive if there's excess nitrogen in the soil. And so we have to be careful how we put these into our system if we're going to get them to work the way that we want them to. All right, so carb, we've talked about carbon, we've talked about nitrogen. Now, but there's all these other things. Hey, we need phosphorus and potassium and calcium and magnesium and iron and manganese and zinc. We need all these other things. Where are those coming from? Are those in the atmosphere? No. Probably a good thing. You wouldn't want to be breathing those anyway. Those are minerals. Those are in our soil. That's what our soil is made up of. But just like plants can't get to the nitrogen in the atmosphere, God never created these plants to pull those nutrients directly from the soil. We have to get tiny little miners employed to extract the nutrients from the soil. Love this picture from this article in Scientific America. It says, mycorrhiza fungi run the largest mining operation in the world. The largest mining operation in the world can only be seen through a microscope. You think about mining equipment, you know, we think of these tires the size of a two-story house, huge equipment, and they're saying the largest mining operation in the world, you have to have a microscope to even see it. It's that tiny. Because it's happening at such huge scale at a microscopic level. So this is a picture of a piece of feldspar. Think of it as a grain of sand. And these little channels that are cut into here, those are mine shafts. Those are hollowed out places. In this piece of feldspar, the mycorrhiza, the hyphae, uh, will secrete the right chemicals, it will recruit the right bacteria, and it will actually dissolve solid rock. And that's what it's doing. It's chemically dissolving, it's chemically mining a shaft in here, it's pulling those nutrients out, and it's delivering it back to its host plant. Because again, as cool as mycorrhiza are, and their superpower is dissolving solid rock, they can't eat that. They have to have carbon. So they'll only do this, again, if the plant is willing to pay in the currency of the economy, which is carbon. Here's another picture of what mycorrhiza look like. These little black things are called the arbuscles. They're actually growing inside the plant root, and then it punctures out through the cell wall, and the hyphae extend out into the soil system and it is bringing in all of these minerals. All these nutrients are coming right back to the plant. So here, this plant doesn't even have to actually do liquid root exudates. It just does an internal carbon exchange because the nucleus of this critter is actually inside the plant roots. Very efficient that way. Uh, the author, Jennifer Fraser, says microphrys of fungi mine the soils not only for the basic things like nitrogen, but also the hard to, come thing, hard to come by things like zinc and copper, which plants need. Oddly enough, 
Many soils are rich in important nutrients, but they're often locked up in a physical form, which makes them unavailable to most plants. <clears throat> we did a, uh, probably about seven or eight years ago, we did a soil health workshop. <clears throat> Dr. Christine Jones, many of you have heard her talk, was there. Ray Ward happened to be there too, Ward Labs. And so she said, Ray, how much phosphorus do you have in your soil? You know, and, you know, being a soil scientist, of course, he's going to know. And he said, yeah, you know, 25 parts per million or whatever. And she said, no, no, Ray, how much total phosphorus do you have in your soil? That's just what's available to the plants. Now, most of us would have no idea what our total phosphorus in our soil is, but because he has his own lab, he knew that number, and I can't even remember what that number was. And then she asked him this question. She says, Ray, if that was all available, how many years could you grow crops before you ran out? So he starts doing some figuring and scribbling and checking, and he'd kind of look up and go, hmm, hmm. Finally, he looks up and he says, I could grow crops for the next 10,000 years with the phosphorus I currently have in my soil. And she says, yeah, that's right. And so can everybody else in this room, too. It's just locked up in a form that the plants can't get to. And if you don't have the biology there to free it up, it's never going to show up on your test. And you will have plants that will show signs of phosphorus deficiency growing in a soil that has enough phosphorus to grow crops for 10,000 years. And we put phosphorus on year after year after year. And there isn't 30,000 tons of phosphorus floating around, folks. The phosphorus fertilizers that we're getting are getting more limited, they're getting more expensive, and they're coming from countries that are largely out of our control. So as American farmers, we have to figure out how to get better at farming with no phosphorus or at least less phosphorus. And we can do it because it's in our soil. We just have to unlock it. We have to free it up. We need the biology there to do it. All right, moving on to infrastructure. Infrastructure, it's the basic equipment and structures that we need to make an economy, make a country function properly. We all know what infrastructure is. The two most important infrastructures are transportation and communication. And we know these are the most important ones because if you declare war on your enemy, the first thing that you do, this is a very common principle of war, you try to disrupt or destroy transportation and communication. Because if you can interrupt those two things, you'll bring a country, you'll bring an economy literally to its knees. I mean, think about it. Think about what would happen to your operation if you couldn't travel and you couldn't communicate. I mean, you should hear the wailing and gnashing of teeth at my house, you know, when we lose internet for a couple of hours. And that's just me, not alone, let alone the kids. It's that important. We're, we're so tied to it. And as I was thinking about this, as I was putting this talk together, I was thinking, you know, one of the reasons the United States has such a strong economy, and I, I took a trip to Brazil about 12 years ago, and their lack of infrastructure is really holding them back from kicking our ass, frankly, when it comes to a lot of agricultural production. And it really struck me that the reason that we are able to do so well, largely, or in part, is because we have this robust interstate highway system. So these are the major interstates in the United States. <clears throat> They're big multi-lane roads. You can move lots of goods and services back and forth very quickly and very efficiently. And that's great. But you know what? I'm clear down here about 20 miles from the Kansas border, and it takes me 50 miles to get up to Interstate 80, and I'm about 70 miles down to Interstate 70. These things do me no good whatsoever if I can't get to them. I have to be able to get to the interstate in order to take advantage of it. So what really makes the system work is not just the interstates, but it's the highway systems connected to them. Now there's very few people very, very few population centers in the United States that isn't halfway close to a paved road. It's going to take you to another paved road. And I hesitate to say good because I've driven on some pretty bad ones here lately. But compared to other countries, they're pretty good. And we can transport our goods and services wherever we want. We take that for granted, frankly. 
But this makes us a very robust and strong economy. <coughs> and it's the same thing that's going on in our soils, folks. These are some really famous pictures of plant roots. This one not colonized with mycorrhiza, this one with. This, these plant roots are the interstate highway systems. They're large corridors that we can move vast amounts of goods and services back and forth uh, between the plant and the soil. Very fast, very efficient. That's great, but it only is good for what it's touching, okay? If I got nutrients or water over here, it, if it can't get to my interstate, it does me no good. So we've got to extend that. We've got to have ways to get the goods and services to the interstates, and that's what mycorrhiza can do. Mycorrhiza is the best drought mitigation thing that you could have for a crop. Forget genetics. Mycorrhiza colonization of a plant will extend its root system four to 600%. Okay, you got the colonization on the roots, and then this is the hyphae that grow out. This isn't actually plant roots. This is mycorrhiza hyphae, but it's drawing it all into these roots, and it's delivering the carbon root exudates out, and it's pulling the nutrients in. And so when we have that, we have a far greater ability to transport things within our soil system when we have the mycorrhiza there. Mycorrhiza fungi transports phosphorus. It's one of the best things for phosphorus transportation. Phosphorus is very hard to access and transport in the soil. But it also will do nitrogen and potassium and all these different things. And in dry times, mycorrhiza can actually deliver water to the plant roots. So again, if you want a drought tolerant crop, make sure you're using the right genetics for sure, but make sure you have the right biology because biology will trump genetics every time. Now, it's not the only thing in there that's helping transport things. Earthworms. Rob was talking about the earthworm population that exploded uh, when, the, when they changed their practices and used the prairie food. Earthworms are a tremendous way to transport things through your soil. The burrows that they leave behind transport water. You know, if you want to be able to say, I got all of my rain, well, if you get a very big rain, and even if you don't get very much rain, you're still going to get a big rain. They just don't come very often. But it seems like when we do get rains, they're coming bigger and bigger and more intense all the time. It's really important you can get that water into the ground, and there's nothing better than an earthworm burrow for getting that water into the ground. So they transport water. Oxygen will use these same pores to move in and out of the soil. These worms are taking surface carbon residue from the surface and pulling it down. And they're actually the public transportation system of the whole economy because the earthworms are eating all this other biology and then they poop it out at different places throughout the soil system. And they do a huge amount of distribution of biological activity through the system. A lot of times people will say, what should I do for a biological soil test? <clears throat> and the first question I ask them, do you have earthworms? And if they say no, then I say, don't waste your money. You got nothing else to be testing for anyway. If they do have earthworms, then we can say, okay, well, you can you know, pull a soil sample and send it to Lance and he'll do his magic and you know, give you a PLFA test or you know, now they can do genetics testing, DNA testing on it and show you exactly what's there. Really cool stuff, you can see what's there, but until you have good earthworm activity, don't waste your money on these other tests because you're not gonna have significant amounts of other biology if you're not seeing the worms. All right, the other infrastructure that's so important is communication. Think about it, how do plants communicate to the biology what they need? Because I just told you that mycorrhiza can transport and deliver all of these things, and that's great, but plants don't need very much of some of these things. Think about boron or copper. Critical for plants to have, but too much, you can kill the plant. So how does the mycorrhiza know when that plant wants copper, or when it wants boron, or when it wants zinc, or when it wants water? Somehow that plant is telling the biology what it wants. Plants have a very robust and complicated communication infrastructure. And the way that they do this is by having different liquid root exudates. Okay, remember 
CO2 plus H2O, C6, H12O6. Well, it's taking that carbon, it's not staying as glucose, it's getting turned into all these other things, tryptophan and adenine and methanone, all of these different things. There's compound, there's carbohydrates and sugars and proteins and fats and lipids and oils, and all of these different things are going into the soil, and each one is different, and it communicates different things to the biology. That's how the plant's communicating. Here's this picture I was telling you about. Rob brought the name Jimmy Emmons up earlier. This is actually a picture taken by Jimmy Emmons uh, from Oklahoma, uh, from his cover crop field. <clears throat> this picture was actually not taken with a microscope. This was taken with his iPhone. He's got a little thing called a proscope on it. You put it right on your camera, and it allows you to digitally magnify what you're seeing. So what this is, this is a cereal rye cover crop root. This is not mycorrhiza extending. He doesn't have near enough magnification to see mycorrhiza. This is just root hairs coming off the main root. But the fascinating thing here, <coughs> look at all those little liquid droplets. Each one of those droplets is liquid carbon that has been made through photosynthesis. It has been converted to all these different things, and now it's being pumped out into the soil system for the biology to consume, but also to communicate to them. Now, the reason that you almost never see pictures like this is because those root hairs are very fragile. And if you just go out there and you dig that thing up and you don't take great care, those root hairs are gonna slough right off. And if you're really, really careful, and you dig it up and you take a bucket of water and you kind of dip it in there, you can preserve those root hairs, but in the process of washing the soil off, you've lost all those little droplets of carbon. The reason that Jimmy was able to get this picture is because this particular root was not growing in the soil. This was growing sideways through a worm channel. So when he dug this up and he broke that uh, shovel full of soil apart, it broke right at a worm channel. So think of the worm channel going like this and that cereal rye root was growing this way. So what you're seeing here is, what, maybe a sixteenth or an eighth of an inch? How, how big would a worm channel be? You know, maybe an eighth of an inch, let's be generous. So what you're seeing there is one-eighth of one inch of one root on one rye plant. Now I asked Jimmy, I said, how big was this rye? I said, maybe eight inches tall. It wasn't full grown by any means. And this tells you you don't have to have 17 tons of dry matter biomass above the ground for your cover crop to be doing great things in the soil. Because start doing the math on this. One eighth of one inch of one root on one rye plant. I've got 1.5 million rye plants per acre. Each rye plant probably has 50 or 60 yards of root mass on each plant and each one-eighth of an inch has hundreds, I didn't count them, but there's a lot, of little liquid carbon root droplets. Start doing the math, folks. That's a lot of carbon being pumped into the soil from an eight-inch tall cover crop plant. This is why we use cover crops. And it's not that the cover crop is magical. It's, the, it's a plant that is doing it. It's just that cover crops are something we can stick in relatively cheap let it grow for a short period of time and not have to worry about harvesting it. That's where the magic is, is we're putting carbon into the soil and we're not harvesting it out somewhere else. <clears throat> so we're feeding biology, we're communicating to them what is needed, <clears throat> and, and I, ask, I ask these scientists this all the time, <clears throat> and someday we're gonna have answers. <clears throat> I ask them, can you tell me what is the root exudate profile of that cereal rye plant. No. no, nobody's done that research yet. And then further I say, so I wanna know what each one of these little droplets is, and then we can you know, say, okay, this plant is producing this profile of root exudates. Then I wanna know what biological organisms is each of those exudates stimulating, and then I wanna know which of those biological organisms that's being stimulated is gonna be best ahead of corn or ahead of beans because now I can design a cover crop mix 
that produces the right exudates to stimulate the right biology to support the next cash crop. Someday we're going to know that information. We don't know that right now. So what do we do? Well, we kind of guess. But we err on the side of diversity because he's got cereal rye here, and that may have 100 different carbon compounds leaking out there. But guess what? If I have a hairy vetch plant right next to it, it may have 100 different types of root exudates leaking out. And if I have a radish plant or a crimson clover plant, once I start stacking these different species of cover crops, I get tremendous amount of diversity, not just above the ground, but especially below the ground, right here. And not just in root architecture, but in root exudates. And that is where the magic really starts happening. Now, there's other things going on communication-wise. I don't have time to get into a lot of details about this. This is a topic that is hugely fascinating to me, probably because I don't understand it very well, but there's some really cool stuff out there. Go to YouTube and just search plant communication, uh, plant biology interaction, our soil health resource guide. I would encourage you to pick up a copy over there. There's a four-page article in there from Nicole Masters on plant biological communication and interaction. But basically, plants can communicate with each other both underground through mycorrhizal fungal networks. Plant roots won't actually ever physically intersect. Plants can't exchange information through their roots themselves. But when you have mycorrhiza growing from a corn plant, and it's extended its hyphae out, and now that hyphae goes into a soybean plant, now we've got them connected. Now they can exchange information. They can exchange nutrients because now I have a physical connection between two plant roots. The roots themselves will never do that, but the biology can. So they can communicate through the roots. They can also communicate through the air through different volatile organic compounds. Uh, and and it's, you, you can smell that. You know, when you mow your grass, you smell that smell. You think that's great? Well, that's the plant putting out a message that it's under attack. <clears throat> But it can communicate, so in this little example here, this plant has aphids, it's communicating through the root system, it's also communicating this way, saying, hey, watch out, aphids are about, this must have been an Australian slide, watch out, mate, aphids are about. Now this plant will start ramping up its defenses against aphids, even though there's no aphids attacking it, because its neighbor said there's aphids in the area, and they're communicating with each other. Another article here from the Scientist magazine going into much greater detail of the same thing, how plants are communicating underneath here, over the top here. Uh, Dr. Jack Schultz, uh, he was at the University of Missouri. I'm not sure where he's at now. Some of you may have heard him at No-Till on the Plains a number of years ago talking about this. Fascinating stuff. He's got some YouTube videos. I encourage you to go and check that out. And then the last section on economics is defense and protection. Because it doesn't matter how great you make your economy, somebody's always going to want a piece of it. Somebody's always going to want to take without giving anything back. Somebody's going to want to consume without producing. And unless you're willing to defend your economy, it's likely going to be destroyed pretty quickly. So in our soil economy, we've got to be protected from lots of things. Too much water, too little water, wind, heat, cold compaction, weeds, insects, diseases, so many different things that can attack our economy. And there's some basic things that we can do agronomically to prevent this, or to at least address this. Number one, keep the soil covered. The first line of defense is soil armor, soil cover. When I was in Brazil, Rolf Derpsch was our tour guide, and he says almost all advantages of the no-till system come from the permanent cover of the soil, and only a few of them come from not tilling the soil. You should always aim at full soil cover. Folks, if you don't keep that soil covered, it's gonna wash away. It's gonna blow away. And all the work that you did to start building it up could be gone in one rain event. Now, and, and again, I know you can't do it all the time because of drought, because of crop failures, because of things like that. But you should always have a plan to try to have full soil cover. Second line of defense is plant signaling. We just talked about this in the communication part, but I want to show you one more example <coughs> of how important this is on the defense side. So this is an experiment done by students at the University of Delaware. 
And, and what they're looking at here is they took a common house plant called a rockcress plant, this plant on the left, uh, they infected it with a pathogen, pathogen called Pseudomonas syringae. And when this pathogen attacks this plant, it turns the leaves yellow, they'll eventually turn brown, then black, and then they fall off, and then that plant dies. The plant in the middle, same type of plant, they infected this plant with Pseudomonas syringae as well. So that has a pathogen in that pot, but it's showing no signs of disease. And the reason is, is because they also inoculated this plant with Bacillus subtilis. It's a beneficial bacteria. And so this is a electron microscope picture and they dyed it so you can see this, but this, this root is from this plant in this pot. And what you see, this, this green biofilm, is billions and billions of Bacillus subtilis that have exponentially increased their population to, to create a physical barrier around the roots that does not allow Pseudomonas syringae in. And the only way that this could do that, the only way that this Bacillus subtilis could, could grow their populations that quickly, is number one, that plant has to say, I need help. So it's got to signal it somehow. And then number two, it has to say, how much carbon do you need to build up your defenses? And it starts the carbon pump, it, it increases the photosynthetic activity, and it pumps that carbon down into the system. The population of the good bacteria explode, and you have a perfectly healthy plant growing in the presence of a pathogen. Healthy plants aren't growing in pathogen-free soils. Healthy plants are growing in soils that are well-balanced, and you've got enough beneficial biology that's offsetting the harmful biology. And so plants can communicate with their biological partners for many, many ways to defend themselves. A third line of defense is that healthy plants produce complex compounds which give natural resistance. And again, we could spend a whole couple of hours on this. Uh, if you've never listened to or heard any of John Kemp's stuff, this is some of John's stuff. <clears throat> this is his plant health pyramid. But basically what he's saying is when you have photosynthesis, photosynthesis is making glucose, which is a very simple sugar. All the insects in your county will send you thank you notes if you leave your plant at that stage because they love glucose. They can digest it. They can make a feast on it. They'll increase their populations. They will completely destroy your crops if they just have those simple sugars in them because insects can digest them. But as your plants are healthier and it turns these, uh, this glucose into proteins and they turn that into lipids and then into these secondary metabolites, every stage as it goes up, the, the carbon chains, the carbon molecules become more and more complex and insects have a very simple digestive system. They can't handle that. And I don't know if it tastes bitter. I don't know if it tastes nasty but they will just stop eating on it because they're no longer able to digest healthy plants. And so what you'll see is the healthy plants in a field will be completely free from insect feeding and the unhealthy ones will have heavy feeding on them. And if you'd go out, uh, and one of the easiest ways to test this is if you have a bricks meter, you can, you can squeeze the sap out, you can look at the bricks, it would give you an indication of how complex are the sugars in there and that will give you a pretty good indication of how healthy your plants are and how naturally resistant they are going to be to diseases. A fourth line of defense is just, there's, there's tons of the examples of symbiotic relationships between plants and organisms. This is an endophyte fungus. It's another fungus that lives in the, plant, the roots of a plant. This is not mycorrhiza. This is an endophyte. It's doing very specific things and helping protect that plant. So there's lots of examples of this. This is a picture from Noble Research. And then a fifth line of defense, have a lot of diversity. Because most insects, most diseases, are only going to attack one or two things in your system. If you have a cover crop and, and you roll your dice and you plant it all to one species of thing, if you have a pathogen out there that likes to hit that one, you may lose it all. But if you've got an eight-way, nine-way, a ten-way cover crop blend that looks like this, well, yeah, I could lose one or two of those species and I'd still be fine. Now, I can't plant this behind corn or soybeans because a lot of that's warm season stuff. 
So if you're going to do this, if you're going to really ramp up your defenses with a lot of diversity to get all of those liquid carbon red exudates in huge diversity, you may have to change other parts of your operation to get some of this stuff to fit in. You can't just squeeze it into what you're currently doing and have it be successful. So there's our keys to a healthy soil, supply, demand, currency, capital, energy, resources, infrastructure, defense, and protection. And I just have a few key quick takeaway points. Economies are intricately interconnected and interdependent, and you can't go messing with one part of it without affecting all of it. And this is exactly what we've seen in agriculture. We have farmed largely in a way that's ignored the biology. The biology has gone away, and we paid the price for it. And the price is we've had to have a lot of inputs. We've still been productive, but it's come at high input. So the second point here is we need to reduce the amount of welfare we're giving our economy, get everyone working, get the biology back involved especially. Number three, increase your cash flow of carbon currency. If you're growing corn and beans, you're only about 50% efficient at capturing solar energy. The rest is wasted. Why not plant something that can take advantage of some of that extra sunlight and turn it into something of value? So we can add a cereal rye cover crop. We can add uh, another crop to a rotation and still add cover crops. We can integrate livestock. And then once we have those extra things capturing solar energy, now all of a sudden we do have excess currency. We can turn that into capital. We can increase our soil organic matter that's a long-term investment when we do that. And if you're making a long-term investment, <clears throat> you're a damn fool if you sell it off right away. But yet, I see my neighbors doing this. They do no-till farming. They do some of these practices. And then they'll come and they'll bail the residue up when they don't have enough to begin with, and they'll sell it off, or they'll do unnecessary tillage. And I'm not saying you shouldn't ever do any of these things, but don't do it when you don't have to. Don't do it when it's not necessary. Number five, take advantage of all the free tiny workers. They'll manufacture, they'll mine, they'll transport, they'll communicate, they'll protect. If you provide them food and a place to live, they'll do pretty amazing things for you, and they do it very, very efficiently. Number six, build and do not destroy your infrastructure. You will really see your economy grow. And again, don't do this. This is an act of war. Destroying infrastructure is an act of war. You're literally declaring war on your soil when you do tillage when it's not needed. Number seven, protect your economy of soil armor. I just had to get that in one more time because it's so important that we keep that covered up. And number eight, diversity is so very important for a healthy economy. Plants, roots, soil, animals, they're all super important there. So that's carbonomics, that's, that's how the economy of a soil works and how it functions. Um, there's my contact information. <clears throat> Feel free to email me. We've got soil health resource guides over on this table over here. Uh, that one with the sunflower is our most current one. You're welcome to grab a copy or two of that. We have all of our old ones. They're all free. They're always free. You can pull those off of our website if you would like. Uh, you can download them right there. <clears throat> and then one other thing, we do have a conference coming up in a couple weeks here as well. Uh, we're going to be having Ray Archuleta, uh, Andy Lyon, who's talking tomorrow, will be there. Uh, the Peterson Farm Brothers, if you've never heard them, they're a pretty good hoot. And then Josh Lloyd, a regenerative farmer from Clay Center. This will be at our facility in southeast Kansas, down in Iola, Kansas. Uh, you can just go to our website for more information, or you can talk to me later about that. So I know I didn't leave any time for questions. I will be over here today and tomorrow, so feel free to come and ask questions as you have them. Thank you very much.